Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Constellation Crew, another happy season. So many of you might notice that I have some new faces with me today. This is my Constellation Crew for this season. We're going to do basically what everyone does on the first day of school. We're going to do icebreaker stuff. Yay. Some of the, some people may find that really great or not so great, but I feel that it'll be a fun experience for this morning. So. For those who don't know, hi, my name is Nicolette. I am a senior here at Ball State. I have a double major in astronomy and physics. And a fun fact about me is my sister has a Dalmatian named Perdita. So, Kenya? Um, hi, my name is Kenya. I'm a senior here at Ball State and I am majoring in elementary education. And a fun fact about me is that I have a cat named Maggie. Aww. And hi, my name is Kyrie. I am a junior here at Ball State, and I am majoring in astronomy. And fun fact about me is I have no pets. Because oh. of college, or you just choose not to? Um, I had a turtle back when I was two, oh. and ever since then, it's never been really any pets. Hmm. Understandable. Strong bond with the turtle. Um, <laughs> so. Today we are using the program Stellarium with the Constellation crew. We are facing south. We have our um, directions here. And so this is going to be just after sunset tonight here in Muncie. We have um, messed with the sky a bit to make it as realistic to the Muncie sky as possible. So we're facing south for a very specific reason. So we're saying goodbye to our summer sky. And what that means is that some constellations are going to be leaving us for a little while until next summer. So let's see if we can find anything interesting facing south in the sky. I think my companion Kenya has some stuff. What can we find in the south tonight? So the first thing in our sky that we're going to be saying goodbye to is called the teapot. Um, so the teapot is um, a pattern of stars called an aster asterism, and it's located in the constellation Sagittarius. Um, it's forming the shape, the shape of a teapot and making for one of the most recognizable summer star patterns. So there are eight stars that make up this teapot and it can be found, um, like Nicolette said, in the south or the southwestern part of the sky. Um, so the image of the teapot includes the pot as well as the spout, lid, and handle. And during some nights you may even be able to see um, steam rising from the spout and the steam that you actually see is a band of the Milky Way. Hmm. Um, so then the second object that we'll say goodbye to in our summer sky is called Antares. So Antares is the brightest star in the constellation of Scorpius. It is a red, large, evolved, massive star and one of the largest stars visible to the naked eye. Its mass is actually around 12, that, uh, times, 12 times that of the sun. And its traditional name um, is derived from an ancient Greek word that I cannot pronounce, um, but it means um, rival to Aries or opponent to Mars. And this is because of the similarity of its reddish hue due to the appearance of the planet Mars. So Ant Aries, like the teapot, is also found in the southern part of the sky and it's further to the west. So if you can find the teapot, you can um, Look to the right of that, and you'll be able to see Antares in our sky. Well, thank you for that. Uh, panning back to the teapot, let's try and see if we can find that tonight. I think it's a relatively easy shape now that I've finally discovered it. it took me forever, because I never understood, because sometimes there's just more stars in the sky if it happens to be a very dark night and it gets very confusing. However, um, if you guys can take a look, so we're going to go towards the bottom of the pot here. Like Kenya said, it was exactly in the south. So here's the bottom, there's the handle, the cute little top, and the spout. So then if I click on it, we can do, there we go. 
And I love how it connects and it actually does look like a teapot to me still because sometimes when you connect the lines, it does not look like what it says it's supposed to be. But I am very pleased that we have a happy little teapot here. And we pointed out earlier that we have Antares here. I actually confused this with, with Mars many a times. <laughs> still do. <laughs> but I just love Mars and Mars is sort of similar in hue if you are very lucky and have a very good sky. Um, in other news, we have a big shape that we're trying to look for in the sky tonight, I think. And I believe my friend Kyrie can help us with that. Of course. So if we look down toward the south and look a bit further up, while sort of facing in the south each direction, we can actually find what seems to be a really cool looking triangle with three very bright stars. And I'll give people a little second to see if they can try to figure out where it is. Okay. So here we are. We are looking right here at the summer triangle and it consists of the three stars, Altair, Denu, and last but certainly not least, I apologize. <laughs> Vega. Is it Vega? <laughs> not, not to worry. See, we're all friends what? here. We're a crew for a reason. <laughs> and the reason it's called the Summer Triangle is because during those midsummer nights, you would actually see the Summer Triangle more closer up, just straight up in the sky. And it would just be really easy to see because it's just three really bright stars. But within the Summer Triangle are three interesting constellations. The Cygnus constellation, which houses the star Deneb. Then we have the Lyra constellation, constellation, which houses the star Vega. And the lastly, but not least, the Aquila constellation, which houses our last star, Altair. And there is a bit of Greek mytho uh, mythology within two of these constellations. And then one of them is not so special, but hey, I still like it. I think it's relatively cute. We'll start with that one first, being Lyra. And that's just simply um, viewed as in the shape of a lyre, which is an old stringed instrument that was used in ancient Greece at around 2600 BC. And people would use it for more recreational or more party type um, places. It's a really good instrument. I do love its sounds. I have heard a liar before the recordings, not in real life, but I still enjoy it. And then next we have our two constellations that have our more mythological um, basis within it. So we'll start off with Cygnus. And the cool thing about Cygnus is that Cygnus was a boy who was a friend of Phaethion, who was the son of, I mean, yeah, who was the son of Apollo. One day, Phaethion wanted to ride Apollo's chariot, the sun, across the sky, but he lost control. And in order to prevent any damage being done to the earth, Zeus sent one of his thunderbolts to the sun, making Apollo fall into the water. Sitting at Cygnus from there, dove into the water like a swan, actually, Aww. and tried to save his friend. Oh, so, that's so nice. Um, so Zeus was so moved by Cygnus's loyalty that he actually turned him into a swan and put his image in the sky to immortalize him. That's and then lastly, but not least, we we have Aquila, which is um, denoted as an eagle. Um, people say that Aquila would hold Zeus's thunderbolts and he, the Aquila eagle had also taken the son of Troy, Ganymede, to Mount Olympus to serve as a cupbearer to the gods. But beyond the Greek mythology stuff, there's actually some really cool, interesting stars to notice within each constellation and i'll quickly go over one 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 that i really enjoy for each constellation and the first one that we'll be looking at is going back to cygnus and the one that i really like is albireo and what's cool about albireo is that it's not an, a singular star but rather it's a double star system hmm. and because of this the, it's we see it as one singular star, but out there it's actually two different stars. And the coolest thing about it is that these two stars are actually like polar opposites of each other. So every star has a certain surface heat, and that surface heat di um, dictates the color of that star. All of the cooler stars will be red and brighter. I mean, hotter stars will be blue. And in that um, double star system, both of uh, 
Albiro A is an orange star, meaning it's um, more cooler since it's more closer to the red spectrum. And Albiro B is a blue star, which means it's hotter. So that's one por portion that I do really enjoy about Albiro. And as you can see, we're zooming here on it now. Yeah, I apologize, viewers. Sometimes we get lucky and sometimes we do not. And in this case, Stellarium does not have a beautiful picture of it. However, in observational astronomy class uh, a few semesters ago, I did actually get to see this visual effect, which was pretty awesome. It's exactly like Kyrie was talking about. There's two distinct different colors. It's quite beautiful thing to see. And you can see it with a telescope for sure. It is quite beautiful, I highly recommend. And then of course, the next constellation that we'll be talking about is Lyra, with, uh, um, which you can find by searching for Vega, which is the brightest star in the summer triangle, ranging from about negative 0.2 to a 0 0.07 magnitude. And just for anybody who isn't aware, how we use magnitude is just to explain the brightness of a star. But the smaller the number it is, the smaller the uh, magnitude is, the actual, actually the brighter the star is. So because Vega is basically circling around that zero line, it's a very, very bright star and is the brightest one within the Summer Triangle. But I actually want to focus on Epsilon Lyrae um, within the Lyrae constellation, and it's given the name Double Double. And the reason for this is it's, again, like with the previous one that we we're talking about, Abiro, it's not a singular star, but actually four stars. It's two binary star systems. And what that means is that the gravitational pull is equivalent between those two stars that one doesn't rotate around the other, but they're actually rotating around each other. And it's like really cool. Um, I really do enjoy binary star systems. Those are probably one of my favorite systems within astronomy, mainly because that was one of the first things I actually did my own individual research on. So that's mainly why the re that was the biggest reason why I wanted to show and focus on this star within the Lyra constellation. Yeah, wow. And there, and there actually is another interesting thing about Lyra is that it actually has the famous ring nebula that everyone may know, may not know. It's one of our more popular planetary nebula. And on your screen should be an image um, indicated by, which is the ring nebula, but it's separated into different colors. And what's interesting about these colors is we can use that to essentially explain the composition of it. The first one that I want to talk about is the red one, and that is basically a broad ring of nitrogen and that's going to be like our base of the nebula itself and then smaller within the red ring is a green ring this is really hot oxygen honestly this ring nebula picture is quite beautiful however i am not seeing the green that Kyrie was talking about and that really does depend on what image you're looking at. So this is Stellarium's. I highly recommend looking up the Ring Nebula online. You can find some very interesting photos that way. Uh, NASA has some beautiful ones and hopefully maybe, maybe, and I'm not sure yet, but maybe James Webb Space Telescope may have one someday or now, and I'm just not aware. Uh, going back really quickly to the binary star systems, that's a very popular research topic here at Ball State. And um, it's estimated that about 85% of all stars could be a part of a binary pair, which is quite interesting. So bringing up the fact that we have two binaries spinning around each other, and I think that was in, was that in Lyra Kyrie or was yes, that? Yes, that is Lyra. That would that be was Lyra. just the one Lyra. Not necessarily bright, but. Okay. So sometimes uh, in other constellations, for example, uh, in the asterism, the Big Dipper, there's actually a lot of uh, visual binaries. So what that means is that they appear to be next to each other and in a system together. Uh, however, that's just based on our perspective. And then there's actual binary systems within the Big Dipper as well. Uh, maybe we can touch on that in another Constellation Crew episode. But wow. 
What an amazing asterism. I did not specify that earlier. So the summer triangle is an asterism. I may have said constellation earlier. However, that's not true. So the summer triangle is actually an asterism and it is made up of the constellations that Kyrie has talked about today. And so an asterism is not a part of the official 88 constellations that we all recognize around the world. Uh, they are sometimes smaller in many cases, and they usually come from um, pieces of a constellation or multiple. In this case, this is multiple constellations making up a asterism. So that was the summer triangle. It always appears very high in the sky all night long, all summer long. So we will say goodbye to our summer triangle here. However, we are not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. We have some more today to look at. And today we're going to be looking for not a triangle this time, but a great square. So I'm going to try to go more to the southeast slash east here. Um, can anyone see a big square? I see a lot of squares and some squiggles. Does the crew see the square at all that I'm looking for? It's a bigger square or a great square. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> no, I'm seeing a lot of squares today. <laughs> right? Yeah. Connect the dots can be very difficult when it comes to the night sky. But I believe our great square is right here, right in the east. There we go. This is the great square Pegasus. And one of the many things that I love about this constellation, other than the fact that it is Pegasus from Greek mythology, is that the great square is very easy to find. And once again, the great square is an asterism and it is a part of the, in, the constellation Pegasus. That is what we are looking at right here. But aside from the Great Square of Pegasus, there is an even more interesting constellation, and I find it pretty cool. So constellations have kind of boundaries in a way. So they map out the sky and there's sort of boundaries around that constellation. And sometimes this helps separate all of the constellations so you don't start connecting constellations to another. In this case, though, there is a constellation that is connected to Pegasus, and that constellation is Andromeda. Now I'm very confused on why Stellarium is drawing Andromeda in this way. I do not recognize Andromeda in this fashion. I recognize Andromeda as a V shape, so usually it goes along this line here. That seems about fine. And then there's another one that sort of connects in a way this way. It's a very narrow shaped V. However, this is how um, Stellarium is drawing Andromeda for whatever reason may be. I highly recommend if you would like to see what I'm talking about looking up sky maps, skymaps.com. You can get a monthly sky map to be able to map out the night sky and see what constellations are up. That is the V that I'm talking about. So look for the great square at Pegasus. And then at the upper corner here, you will find that Andromeda branches out. So there is actually a very interesting object within this constellation. So let's see here. We're going to bring this up and I'm actually going to put the cursor in the type box this time. There we go. I don't know where you're pointing, friend. I believe it's pointing to this image here. Does anyone recognize this galaxy? Mm -hmm. 
I find this galaxy slightly threatening in a way, because for those who don't know, this is the Andromeda Galaxy, and we are on a collision course with it. We meaning the Milky Way Galaxy. Yes, uh, galaxies can collide and do. If uh, any of our viewers today have come to the James Webb Space Telescope program here at the planetarium, we actually do show a galaxy that did possibly, most likely, have a collision course, and I believe it's called the Cartwheel Galaxy? If I remember correctly, it's quite beautiful and actually looks kind of fuzzy and ring-like. Very beautiful because it's the aftermath of the collision. So when I say collision, please do not panic. Uh, first off, that won't happen for a very, very long time. I'm talking billions of years from now. And of course, when it does, because of the cartwheel galaxy still being intact, obviously it's not necessarily a death sentence for a galaxy. It's just some rearranging. You know, it needs to mold itself into something new. It's changing. And sometimes change can be a very beautiful thing. So what do you guys know about this constellation? And I'm addressing the crew here or the Andromeda Galaxy. Any facts you guys know? It's been a minute since I brushed up on my uh, Greek mythology history of Andromeda itself, but if I recall correctly, was it some type of princess? Hmm. Could you repeat that for me? I didn't quite hear. I asked, was it some type of princess? I couldn't remember exactly what yes. the history behind it was. So um, for all of our uh, long-term fans, if you've been watching the Constellation Crew program for a very long time, uh, I was known as the mythology expert. Uh, expert's a big word, but I was I was known to talk about mythology a lot in our Constellation Crew programs. And I did touch on Andromeda and she was a princess and she was chained to a boulder to be sacrificed to a sea beast. Um, a sea beast of Poseidon, I believe. I believe Poseidon was very upset with Andromeda's dad, who was a king. And they and the king pleaded with Poseidon, and he said, the only way I'll fix it is if you do this one thing. And Andromeda was chained to a boulder. Let's see if I can bring up the art here. Looks like I'm going to have to bring up all of the art, which sort of frustrating oh there we go just the selected so see here she is has her little chains but she is saved and don't worry she is saved by a warrior if i remember i don't remember it is not hercules i know that it is not hercules uh maybe it was perseus i believe it was perseus and they are very they were very happy and i believe they had a family and had a wonderful time together once he saved her it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. All right. One thing that I would like to specify here is that earlier when I was talking about the upper corner of Pegasus, this corner, this star here is actually attached to Andromeda, meaning it's a part of the Andromeda constellation. And one star cannot be a part of two constellations. It's usually how we keep things in order. But the fact that these two are actually connected in a way. Um, I can't say share the same star because they don't, but it's just very fascinating to me that um, they're connected in a way. So next we have some fun stuff that a lot of people are very interested in. I always am, and I never knew that you could actually see these objects in the sky until about when I got to college. <laughs> I know, but uh, we're going to be seeing if there are any planets in the sky tonight that we can see. So, my favorite, we're going to be looking for Saturn first. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little here because I can't tell which one is Saturn at the moment. A lot of these stars are very big. However, a nice helpful tip. If you were looking at the actual night sky here in Muncie just after sunset and you were trying to find a planet, any planet really, check to see if the object you're suspecting is a planet is twinkling. So you see in maybe Christmas programs or any program, all the stars are kind of 
changing their brightness very quickly. That's twinkling. So that can be caused by a lot of different things, but planets do not twinkle. Um, so we're, we don't see that here in Stellarium, meaning I don't believe I have the twinkle feature on. You can turn that on here in Stellarium, but I'm going to cheat and look for Saturn this way. And I can show you how to find, or find it once I know where it is. <laughs> I suspect it as much. Of course. So here is Saturn. And if you have a very nice telescope and you point your telescope towards Saturn, you can actually see Saturn's rings. It's a very beautiful thing and very moving. I love looking at Saturn at night. It's quite beautiful. So Saturn is actually close to the constellation Capricornus. And for those who are very big Zodiac fans, that is a part of our Zodiac constellations here. So we're gonna zoom into Saturn here. Oh, look at that. So beautiful. Our beautiful planet here. So Capricornus is actually pretty hard to see, especially if you are in uh, at, in the middle of campus uh, here in Muncie at Ball State, because Ball State has a lot of street lights for our safety, which I greatly appreciate. However, that does make it very hard to see more of the fainter stars. And Capricornus has a lot of fainter stars compared to the rest of the stars in our night sky. However, you're gonna want to look for, you guessed it, a funky looking triangle. Um, uh, here at the planetarium, our planetarium director, Dana, mentioned that it kind of looks like a scone, and I firmly agree with that statement. However, once again, if you noticed when I before I started zooming in, the constellation in Stellarium does not look like a scone. In fact, it looks more like a goat to me, which makes sense because Capricornus is uh, the goatfish constellation. However, again, in sky maps, it is drawn more in a scone-like shape scone meaning the pastry i should specify that so i am not sure why <laughs> stellarium is drawing it so weird but uh any fun facts about this planet from my crew here well i have one yes. um yeah Kyrie. Oh, um i guess really not so much a fun fact but also a fun fact is that the cool thing about Saturn is that even um, if I do recall, a lot of our more outer planets do actually have rings themselves, but Saturn is the only one that actually has them more so visible, as I would say. Oh. Very interesting. Um, our planetarium social specialist here, Melanie, loves to say that Saturn is the king of moons, having the most moons in our solar system. I don't know the exact number. Does anyone on my crew know the exact number by chance? I believe it's somewhere in the 80s. Yeah, it's possible. 82 moons? Does that sound familiar to anyone? 82 sounds about right to me. Um, that's a lot of moons. <laughs> and surprisingly, none of those moons are um, the ring system itself here. I believe there is a moon located within the rings, but those 82 moons are not the ring system itself. And speaking of the ring system, I do have a video that I would like to show our viewers today. And it's a very popular one here at the planetarium. We're going to take a look at Saturn's rings. It's a beautiful ring system um, made up a lot of mostly icy rocks. Very beautiful. And uh, one of my favorite parts about this video is that we do kind of go in to the rings, kind of like you feel like you're actually there, which is quite beautiful. As we're kind of roaming around in these rings, the icy rocks can vary in size from something very, very small, like a pebble that you find outside of your house to the size of a school bus some big rocks, <laughs> icy rocks. Uh, so the fact that there are so many and so many that vary in size as well is what makes them so, so bright. 
uh, James Webb Space Telescope did take some pictures of some of the planets in our system, in our solar system, Jupiter included. And in one of the images, you actually do see a very faint, small ring system around Jupiter. It's very, very, very small. It's the first time that I've actually seen it because I've heard, but never seen before, that many of our gassy giants do actually have a very small, faint ring system. I've just never been able to get an actual image of that. Well, of course, I couldn't. I've never seen one. But now James Webb made my dream come true, and it actually is quite beautiful. It's a little wispy, haunting, like, because it's very small. So let's get um, out of the rings here, because I don't know about you all, but seeing all of those rocks make me kind of scared. So we're just going to fade out of that video here. So, uh, if you're looking for Saturn tonight, it'll be above the horizon around the time that it gets dark. Sometimes when it gets dark, some planets are still trying to make their way above the horizon. In this case, it will be above the horizon uh, just after sunset. And if you're looking for Capricornus, it is that funky scone shape. However, do not feel bad if you cannot find it. It is okay. It is a very faint constellation. Anything else to add today, crew? I do believe there's one last planet that is available to see tonight as well. And they usually come together often anyway. And that is Jupiter. Jupiter is pretty um, easy to see, at least for me. Again, look for non-twinkling objects. And Jupiter is actually the brightest of the two. Can anyone on the crew tell me why? It's the biggest uh, planet in our solar system. So it reflects a lot more of the sun's light than it would for any other planet. Well, there you go. It is quite large. And in respect, Jupiter is closer than Saturn. So I would imagine that would also be a great effect on that as well. But yeah, Jupiter is very, very large. <laughs> very large. And... I believe uh, our show specialist shared this fact with me the other day, Melanie, that uh, everyone knows the big red storm on Jupiter or the big red spot, the big red spot. Uh, it's not an, in this image, but it's very popular. It's just a big, big red spot. And it's a giant storm that's been raging on Jupiter for a very, very, very long time. And I believe if I remember correctly, Melanie said that the giant red spot uh, would fit three Earths across. So, <laughs> to put that into perspective, that's just the storm. That's just the storm. <laughs> this planet is very, very big. Um, and of course, if you could, if you could imagine, this is a gassy giant um, or a gas giant. And so all of this that you're seeing is just ribbons and swirls of different colored gases and how they're all mixing together. And because of that, sometimes the bands, or not necessarily the bands, but the storm itself, the giant red, the great red spot, goodness, can vary in size from time to time. But it is still holds true that it's a roughly three, maximum of three Earths across. Very, very big. So... You might have noticed as I zoom back out. Oh, before I zoom all the way out, these little spots here, those are the four Galilean moons. And I didn't know this until recently either. Gotta love college. You can see the Galilean moons when you look, when you have a nice telescope, you gotta have a very nice telescope. Um, you can see them um, with Jupiter. Now, of course, so you see how one's kind of off to the side here. These moons are still orbiting Jupiter. So you may not see them, all four of them, at the same time. Or you may not see all four of them in a straight line. That's my favorite way to view them sometimes because they just look so beautiful. Uh, that is because they're still orbiting Jupiter and they may go behind Jupiter. And they're hiding, you know? They're shy. Got to give them some time. Got to get them all dolled up so that they can make their appearance. So the four of them... Um, are Io, Callisto, yes, Ganymede, and Europa. 
quite beautiful. But back to the uh, other thing that I wanted to mention. So Jupiter is in the east, of course, and it's very close to the horizon just after sunset. So you may need to give Jupiter some more time to finally reach up there because you might have some tall buildings in your way, some trees and such. However, um, just give Jupiter some more time and they will definitely make an appearance, I promise. <laughs> and of course, Saturn is nice and high in the southeast for you. All right, with that being said, is there anything else that my crew would like to add today to our program? No? All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming to our program today. It is so nice to finally see all of you guys again, or at least know that you're all with us today. Uh, please keep an eye out for any of the constellations that we have mentioned today. Hopefully you can say hi and goodbye to them before some of them disappear until they come back for uh, next summer and we can start talking about some winter constellations. Feel free to check out skymaps.com. I uh, highly recommend that resource for looking at skymaps. And of course, we will be um, putting our various social media pages and websites and such in the description of this video. So feel free to check us out and we hope we see you guys again soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>